world for the rest of you. I'm super glad that you are here today. I'm glad that we have this opportunity to gather together. Um, if this is your first time joining us, um, I want to catch you up and let you know that we are at a very tail end of a series that we've been in the middle of, um, which is all about how to read the New Testament letters. We've been learning about the New Testament letters through the lens, uh, through the example of 1 Corinthians, um, which I told you, I think, last week that 1 Corinthians is actually one of the most difficult letters in the New Testament to read and understand in context. Um, and so, uh, you know, people were like, why did you choose that one? And I said, because I can. I can choose it. I figured if we did the hardest one together, then you would be more equipped to then go from this place and continue reading and diving into the New Testament letters and understanding um, some of what is going on in them. Um, chances are that if you grew up in churchianity, uh, you've had this experience where the letters in the New Testament were taught, were most often taught from, that they were probably the books of the Bible that were most often, you were encouraged to read more than any other parts of the Bible. Uh, maybe it was because it was touted as like, hey, this is the easiest one to understand. Um, they seem pretty straightforward. They seem like they have these direct, literal commands. There's an author who uses the pronoun you, so it feels like they're talking directly to you. But what sometimes gets missed in this type of reading is the context. We completely ignore the genre and the context of the New Testament letters. What we miss is that they actually are indeed a real letter. It was a literal correspondence between one person to a completely different group of people that you weren't a part of. They had a personal relationship between the author and the receiver that you weren't a part of. They lived in a culture that was very different from our own culture, and they probably, most likely, definitely did have conversations that are outside of that letter that you weren't privy to. And so during this series, we've been trying to look at the letter through a new lens. We've been trying to understand it. What is it really? We've been looking at them through these different layers of context. We've been talking about the literary context of a letter. What exactly is a letter? How was it created? Who authored these letters? And how do we understand them as a whole, not just one verse here and there picked out? But what's the main point, the overarching message that can be tracked through the whole letter? We've been looking at the cultural context of these letters, sort of what historically was happening, what culturally was happening, and how does that change how we understand what they're talking about? We looked at the situational context. Uh, what were the relationships like? What could we kind of glean from what's there? And what do we have to imagine based on what's not there? These were real people having real relationships and real conversations with real problems. And we gave this example of if I was to write a letter to my husband and you all just listened into it, uh, there would be some things that you would be like, I guess I get that. But there would be other things that you're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they're talking about, right? And you just have to sort of guess. And that's also what we're doing as we unpack the situational context of these New Testament letters. We also looked at the biblical context, that these letters are coming as a part of this grander biblical story and that we really need to understand in order to understand a piece of it. How does it fit into the larger uh, story, God's story that's told to us through um, the biblical story? So in doing so, in unpacking all of these different contexts, we've been finding that there is the good news that emerges from these letters is not just moral advice, and it's not just a recipe for private spirituality. Instead, it's an announcement about Jesus that allows us to see every different part of life, every different aspect of life through this whole new gospel lens. Now, last week, we looked at one of the more challenging passages in 1 Corinthians um, that looks at how a woman is to, uh, about a woman's, that's talking about a woman's appropriate behavior in the context of a church gathering. It's this passage that has been understood and interpreted lots of different ways by scholars, by churches, by denominations over generations. Um, we basically looked at four different common readings and understandings of those passages based on the context. And I kind of laid the pros and cons out of those things and said, hey, 
you guys kind of have to deal with that. You kind of have to look at that. And then I use that as an introduction to help us understand the importance of looking at the letters in the context of the biblical story. How, what, how does what it says in this specific text fit into the overarching story of scripture? If it's this unified story, it has to align. It can't be a sharp turn to the right or to the left. So how do I understand this one piece and how does it fit into this overarching story? Those are guideposts that can often help us determine the most likely original meaning or it can at least help us eliminate some other readings. Now I heard from several of you this past week based on our sermon last week based on our conversation last week. I heard that several of you this week uh, had some really good conversations, that what we talked about last week stirred up some really great dialogue. And I just want to say, I heard some of it, and I was so excited. I was so excited about the great dialogue that was happening, because for me, those sorts of conversations are a sign of incredible growth. Like, like, Look at y'all, you're asking great questions and you're like listening to each other. And that is like, that is chef's kiss right there. Like that is so good. You're listening to each other's responses and you're thinking critically about the word of God. Like you're looking like followers of Jesus. And I'm so, so excited and ecstatic about that. Now, of course, when we get into these types of conversations, there's another really great question that comes up as a result of these conversations. What do we do as followers of Christ if we disagree? What do we do as followers of Christ if we disagree? That there are some really, really big disagreements in the realm of Christendom. There just really are. There are disagreements um, within Christendom. There just, there just is. Now, the reality is some disagreements take us outside the realm of Christendom. There are some disagreements where we're no longer talking about Yahweh, the God of the scripture, there are some disagreements where we're no longer talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who took on flesh and died and rose again for the redemption of humanity. There are some disagreements where we deny the work of the Holy Spirit. There are some disagreements that are considered core and essential to the faith. And we've got to kind of demarcate those. In fact, Clarksburg Church has a history, which is a part of the Church of God out of Anderson, Indiana. And the Church of God out of Anderson, Indiana is not a denomination. It's non-denominational. And there's really a key reason for that. Instead, we're a part of a movement, right? There's a really key reason for that. The Church of God out of Anderson, Indiana emerged during a time where there were lots of denominational schisms. Churches were breaking off for all sorts of different reasons because of these disagreements that were happening. They were happening right and left. And this group of Jesus followers saw that and they were like, oh my gosh, what Jesus tells us in John 17 is that we are supposed to be unified, that the world will know that we belong to God by our unity, by our love for one another. And they said, we don't want to see more breaking among the believers. We want to see more unity among the believers. So they didn't want to start a denomination based on unity because that felt backwards. So instead they said, we're just going to be a movement and we're going to call it the church of God and we're going to say, hey, anyone who believes in the essentials, then, then you are a part of the church of God. You're a part of God's church. So we're not going to have membership to certain congregations or membership to a certain denomination. We're just saying, hey, you're in if you believe in these essentials, if you believe that Jesus was the Son of God, if you believe in the God that's revealed in Scripture, if you believe that the Holy Spirit is refining us to holiness, if you believe that we are to love God and love our neighbor, these are the essentials. These are the things that unify us. So they named it a movement instead. And so you are a part of this family of believers who are saying, we're going to hold together in unity of the other things, but what if we disagree? 
What if we disagree? What are we supposed to do? The question remains, what do we do when we do our due diligence? We read the te text as faithfully as possible. We look at through all of the cultural lenses. And still, when it comes to something that's not an essential, one follower of Jesus says, I think it means this. And the other follower of Jesus says, ah, I, I think I disagree. I think it means this other thing. What do we do when followers of Jesus disagree? Fortunately, fortunately, in the last section of 1 Corinthians that we haven't looked at yet, it is about these two groups of Christians, these two groups of followers of Jesus, who are having these serious disagreements about food. And so to get started, we're going to have a little conversation. Okay. Now, we often do these things in our church where when we gather together, we try to create opportunities to talk to one another because actually you are the body of Christ. And if you don't know who's in the body of Christ, you can't be like, hey, ear, what do you hear? You know what I'm saying, right? So we try to build up the body by having these conversations with one another. So what I'm going to invite you to do is in a second, you're going to turn to the person to your right and your left. You're going to introduce yourself to them. And you're going to try to include somebody that you did not drive here with. Okay? All right? And then once you introduce yourself, you're going to look behind you. Everyone look behind you real quick. Stare awkwardly at the person behind you. And then look awkwardly at the person in front of you. You're going to make sure you know your surroundings. And you're going to make sure that everyone has a group to be a part of. Because let me tell you, there is nothing worse when you are sitting there and you're like, no one invited me into their group. Right? That's the worst. And so we're going to do our due diligence as the family of God to make sure and practice that we know everyone belongs. And we're going to invite everybody in to these little conversation groups. This is an easy question. It's an easy one. So after you introduce yourselves to each other and you form your little groups, you're going to talk about this. You're going to share a disagreement about food that you have with someone close to you. A disagreement about food. This is an easy one. All right? Okay. Go ahead. Go in your groups. Talk about a disagreement you have about food. Remember, look to your right and your left, up, forward, and behind. Make sure no one is left out.
All right, all right, we'll bring it back, whole group. Okay, so before we move on, I wanted to hear what are some of the disagreements. <laughs> what are they? Oh, what was the dis what's the disagreement? <laughs> if it should be sweet or savory? Oh, savory. Oh, oh. Okay, what's another one? What's another one? Garlic? What is the, again, what's the problem? <laughs> Love it. Who would not? Oh. <laughs> Donna. <laughs> okay, yeah. Oh, compartmentalize. Okay, we got to raise hands. Okay, mishmash galui. Raise hands all together. Okay, and then uh, compartmentalization. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, all right, we can, we can do that. All right, any others? Yeah. Oh, Brussels sprouts. Is there anybody that's like, I love them? Lo love? I said love, guys. <laughs> love? Like, like I can like them. Okay, uh, what else? Pineapple on pizza. Okay, we're just going to do pro pineapple on pizza, anti. Pro, 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 pro. Okay, anti. Okay, indifferent. Indifferent. Okay, indifferent. All right, we got one more. One more food disagreement. Anything cold? Like, is that okay or not okay? It's not okay. Not okay? What about like, what about like a salad? Like a, oh, you like to eat cold food. You don't mind it. It's okay. Oh, huh. All right. I'm trying to think of something that I would be like, I will not eat that cold. I will eat chicken cold, like chicken on a salad. I'm, I would eat fried chicken, cold. French fries. French fries gets a little borderline, like French fries, I'm not sure. But I will tell you, uh, my husband, well, my husband will tell you, I like, I prefer my food like boiling lava hot. Like if I'm going to heat it up, it's going to be like, it has exploded in the microwave three times and now I'm immediately sticking it in my face. Yeah, it's terrifying, he says. That's good. Okay, so here, this is great. This is great. I love that we can have a conversation about this. This type of conversation probably didn't happen in Corinth during the first century about this particular issue. It was much more hot and topic and, and divisive. Um, we have these disagreements, and we can kind of have fun with them, and we can dis disagree on them. But for those people, for the, the church in Corinth, this was not a lighthearted issue. This disagreement actually gets unfolded in the the, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 through 10, and Paul doesn't address issues of food preferences, like do you like ice cream better than cake, or is Chick-fil-A sauce better than ketchup? The answer is yes, clearly. <laughs> Instead, their disagreement was actually about food, eating food, particularly meat, that had been sacrificed in the local temple to the Greek and Roman gods. This was one of those cultural things that we really have to dig into to understand. And so I'm going to give a little bit of a cultural context to what that looks like, and then we'll go from there. At that time, a person, uh, a, a person who was not a believer, not a, not a Jewish person, anybody who was outside the Jewish faith, um, would commonly bring an animal to a Greek or Roman temple that would be in whatever city that they're in, and the animal would be slaughtered on the altar as a sacrifice in worship to whatever the god is that was celebrated in that local city. It was a way to sort of acknowledge the god, to worship the god, and then to ask the god for blessing. Like if this was the fertility god, you would offer this meat as a way to say, please, I would like to have children. Please, I would like for my crops to grow big this year, whatever the thing is, right? 
And then that God would be offered a piece of that meat, and the way that God would be offered a piece of that meat would either they would burn it up in a fire, they would leave it on the altar to like rot, or the priests and priestesses would take a cut of that meat, and then that would become sort of their portion that would sustain them, and they would live off of. Now the rest of the meat, the rest of the animal that had been sacrificed on the altar was then given back to the person who brought it, and they would then take that meat, and they would go into the marketplace, and they would sell it to make their living or they would take that meat and then they would have like a huge party. They would invite everyone and be like, come on, everybody, let's eat this great thing, right? And that's sort of what they would do. They'd invite all these people to come celebrate with this meat that had been offered to the gods. Now, we might think like, oh, religious meat sales, that happened in a special location in the grocery store, right? Or um, you might think like, oh, a religious feast, that happened on a special day in a special part, and you knew what that looked like and that you were going to those places. But that's not at all how it worked. Sacrificial meat was so common in Corinth that would it, it would have been really difficult to buy meat that wasn't sacrificial meat. Culturally, the Corinthians rolled all of their business practices, all of their networking, all of their political gatherings, all of their religious activities into one big conglomeration. So if you were just going to like the town festival, shocker, it's a religious festival also. You are eating meat. If you're participating in these meals, you're eating the meat that had been sacrificed to the gods. And these were the places where business deals happened. This is the place where normal socialization happened. They were the place where you would gain patronage or support. They were places that you would just go and like be with people, not be a recluse in your town. And they weren't unique things. They were regular and they were normal. If you went to somebody's house for a meal, chances are the meat was meat that had been sacrificed to an idol, to a temple. It was very common, and it was very difficult to avoid. And so when we do a mirror reading of these chapters, remember we've talked about mirror readings before, when we do a mirror reading of these chapters, what we see is that there's a split between these two groups of people, and the split was likely between the Jewish Christians who had always grown up with dietary restrictions, and the non-Jewish Christians, the Gentile Christians, who had likely grown up a part of these sacrificial practices. And the Jewish Christians were saying, listen, we've done this all of our life. Don't eat the meat. It's not that big of a deal. Maybe you have to be a vegetarian. It doesn't, don't eat it. Don't participate in it. And then the non-Jewish Christians were saying, well, actually, like, it's really just not that big of a deal. Like, it's fine. Just eat it. And once again, Paul takes this cultural disagreement and he looks at it through this new lens, a gospel lens. And for us to understand Paul's lens, what we're going to do is we're going to actually start at the end. We're going to start at chapter 10 where Paul gives his conclusion and then we're going to like work our way backwards to see how Paul gets there. And so Paul gives at the very end these two sentences, these two, sorry, these two scenarios about how we should deal with this issue of the food, the meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 10, chapter 25 through 27. He gives scenario A. He says, listen, here's the first scenario. Eat anything you want. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising a question of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising any questions of conscience. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. What Paul is saying is that like, hey, listen, as Christians, we believe that God is the creator of all things, including this animal. And the temple idols are just pieces of wood and stone. So if there is no one around who's going to misunderstand your actions, don't ask any questions. Don't investigate the issue anymore. Just eat up. You're a new human in Christ. Follow your conscience and the Spirit's leading in these kind of debatable matters. So in scenario A, he's like, yeah, eat it. It's fine. 
But then he gives us in scenario B. We jump to verse 28. He says, if, but if someone says to you, this has been sacrifice, offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of their conscience. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jew, Greek, or the church of God. Now, what he's saying here is, listen, like that was scenario A, but scenario B, if you're in a situation where the meat is sacrificed to another God and there are people around who, and you know that it was, and there are people around who are watching you, and they might see you eating that meat and then conclude, oh my gosh, there is a Christian eating the meat that was sacrificed to another God, that must mean that Christians must worship Jesus and worship these other gods too. He says, if that's going to happen, then don't eat it. He says, your loyalty is to Jesus, and you don't want to give anyone the wrong impression or create a way for them to get compromised in their relationship with Jesus. So in one scenario, Paul's like, don't eat it. And in the other scenario, Paul's like, eat up. So the question becomes, what makes it okay to eat in one situation, but not in the other? And this is how Paul got there. We're going to back up to chapter 8. Paul starts to address the topic by saying, in verse 1 of chapter 8, he says, now about food sacrifice to idols. So again, we get this indicator that they must have had a previous communication with Paul about like, hey, this has been an issue. We need you to speak into this. So Paul's like, okay, let me speak into it. Now about the food sacrifice to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge. Now, the word knowledge and knowing or know is going to be this key word and concept that comes up throughout these chapters and in this passage. It seems that the group who thought that it was okay to eat meat justified it based on the idea that they have a knowledge. They know something. They know that God was sacri- that the God that this was sacrificed to wasn't real. They know that the God, the Father, is the one true God and He, in him we live. They know that there's only one Jesus through whom all things came to be and in whom they live. And because we know this, whether meat has been sacrificed to idols or not, it doesn't really matter. It only matters if you don't know what we know. And since we know it, it doesn't matter, you know? And Paul is like, oh my gosh, I get it that you know things. But you know what you don't know? And Paul continues. He says, knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know what they ought to know. But whoever God loves, but whoever loves God is known by God. Paul is basically saying that this thing that you think you know, this knowledge that you think you have about like, how much these gods aren't real and you know that this doesn't really mean anything. Like, all of this knowledge that you think you know is really just puffing you up. It's inflating you to make you think that you are smart and you are wise. It's making you think that you are strong. It's making you think that you understand all of these things, but this knowledge is just inflating you and you think you're justified. But all that knowledge is just air. It looks big, but it isn't that strong. And he's like, you know what is strong? Love. Love builds up. Paul is saying that the core principle that we should actually be following in these types of tricky, debatable matters is love. And so then Paul continues. He says, be careful. Be careful, however, that the exercise that that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all of your big, puffy, inflatable knowledge, eating at an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is then destroyed by your knowledge. Remember, love builds up, but now you're destroying them. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I would never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. 
What Paul is saying is that all of your knowledge and puffy air that you're using to determine what is right or wrong for you to do or not do might actually be the very thing that's breaking down and destroying your brother or sister who Christ died for that is right next to you. It might be causing them and pushing them away from Christ. Now notice how Paul uses these words, the opposite of building. He uses these words destroyed. He uses these words fall. He's trying to make this comparison of like, listen, love builds up, but what you're doing with your knowledge is actually destroying people. He's saying you might have the right to eat this meat, but your inflated knowledge is actually tearing your brother and sister down. And love, love is supposed to build them up. And so then in chapter 9, if you continue to read through the whole thing, In chapter 9, it seems like Paul starts to talk about, like, something totally different. Like, if you've been, I've been asking you to listen to 1 Corinthians all together in one sitting each week that we've been in this study. And if you've been listening, you probably get to 8, and you're like, yep, food sacrifice to idols. And then 9, and you're like, how does this have anything to do with it? And then 10, you're like, yep, food sacrifice to idols again. How does 9 fit? And we're going to talk about that. It seems like Paul is talking about something totally different whether or not the Corinthians should be like paying Paul for his service. But if you read it carefully, you begin to see that Paul is actually giving this fascinating, really convicting comparison between Paul's rights to receive a monetary compensation from the church in Corinth and the followers' right to eat the meat sacrificed from idols. This is what Paul does. He says in classic Paul style, he's like really like leaning into them hard. Paul points out that it is his right as an apostle, as the one who brought them into a relationship with the Lord, that he should be receiving like a monetary compensation from the church in Corinth. They should be paying him. He has that right to be supported financially by them, to not have to get another job. Um, They should be taking care of him and giving him something for uh, his spiritual seed that he has sown, and he should be reaping a financial uh, fruits of his labor. And he like lays it into them. In fact, he even references Jesus. And he's like, Jesus even taught us that if you teach the gospel, you should be able to live off of the profits of the gospel. You should be able to receive your living from the gospel. Like Jesus said this, he's laying into them. He goes on on about this for like 12, 13, 14 verses, right? It's not a quick one sentence. He's like, let me really get you to understand. You owe me big time, right? This is what Paul does. And then Paul says this, he says, but we, me and Barnabas, we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Paul is saying that he and his companions have the right to ask for more money and more financial support, but he didn't. He says, we gave up that right because we didn't want anything to get in the way of the good news of Jesus spreading and being accepted among you. And so Paul continues in verse 18. He says, what then is my reward? Like, what do I get out of preaching the gospel if it's not some sort of like patronage? He says, it's this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. While it sounds like Paul is being really self-deprecating, Paul is actually pointing out that he is disadvantaging himself so that the gospel of Christ can spread. He's willing to let go of his rights or his rightness. He's willing to set aside his knowledge of what he's allowed to do. And Paul is making himself a servant if it means that he has a better shot of others being built up to in a relationship with Jesus. And Paul's saying, guys, this is what love looks like. Love denies itself its own rights. It denies itself what it is owed so that it can look out for the well-being of other people. Love sets aside what it is sure it knows in order to make sure that a brother or a sister has the opportunity to be built up in Christ. Now, I know that you aren't likely going to have the same disagreements as the church in Corinth. 
but chances are there are disagreements that will arise with other believers if they have not yet already. Maybe it might be about baptism for an infant versus a believer. Or maybe it's about whether women should be in a leading role in a church. Or maybe it's about the actual way that somebody comes to be saved. Is it God's actions first or our decision? Or maybe it's on our social views, our political views. Which translation of the Bible is best? How much a person has to change their behavior before they can be included in the family of God? What, whatever it might be, there are going to be disagreements. Not just between our church and another church, but us as fellow believers in the body of Christ together in this room. Followers of Jesus have disagreed about this stuff from the very beginning, and it's really likely that we're not going to solve it, and it's going to continue. And I think that Paul is saying it is way more important to love each other, which builds up, than to tear each other down with the inflated rightness of our knowledge. Now, I know how this sounds. I know that sometimes the reaction can be like, well, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Are we just supposed to let people be wrong then? Doesn't truth matter? Aren't we being loving by like correcting them and telling them you're wrong, right? What if their ignorance is actually causing a separation between them and Jesus? I want them to know the right thing, just like I know the right thing. The thing about being right is that oftentimes when you care more about being right than about loving someone, sometimes you can write that person right out of the room. But if you love God and you are known by God, if you love God, you are known by God. Now, when I was thinking about this verse, what Paul says in chapter 8, if you love God, you are known by God. I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about who do I know? What does that look like to really know someone? Not something, but someone. And I was thinking about, you know who I really know? I really know my kids. <gasps> I really know my kids. I know them so well. That on my good days, not every day, but on my good days, I can anticipate the pitfalls that are going to happen. On my good days, I can anticipate the places that they are going to struggle, the things they are going to misunderstand, the challenges that they are going to have, the areas that I'm going to need to come alongside them and be really gentle, and the other areas where I'm going to have to come alongside of them and be really firm and be like, knock it off. Knock it off. On my good days... I know my kids well enough to walk alongside them, to guide them and correct them in a way that is going to actually be constructive for them, that's going to build them up on a good day, right? But you know who always has good days. And you know who knows you, or maybe even more importantly, who knows the person that you are so concerned about not having the right knowledge? You know who knows them? If they love God, God knows them. God knows them. God can anticipate the places where they're going to struggle. God can anticipate the things that they're going to understand and the challenges they're going to have and the areas that God is going to need to come alongside them and be gentle and when God is going to have to be like, listen, knock it off. God knows them well enough. God knows his children well enough to walk alongside them and guide them and correct them in a way and in the timing that is actually going to be constructive for them, that is going to build them up in love. Now, this doesn't mean that we all sit on the truth that we have learned and, like, keep our mouths shut. It means that we still share. We still gather together. We learn together. We grow together. But it also means that when we come to a place of disagreement, we can actually lean into love because we both serve a God who is bigger and wiser than we are. And Instead of tearing each other down by trying to prove who knows what and who is right, 
we can actually trust that God will move in both of us. We can actually begin to pray a prayer that says, God, we don't see eye to eye. So God, change them or change me. I might be wrong. (laughs) I might be wrong. So God, change them or change me. And if both of us are surrendered to the Holy Spirit, we will be transformed. Maybe not immediately, but in God's timing, we will move forward in unity. Love denies itself its rights, and it looks out for the well-being of other people. This is the kind of love, God's love, that is core to the gospel. It's core to the good news. It's what Jesus did for us when he died for us. Jesus had all the knowledge in the world, right? Jesus was there since the beginning of creation. He knew how the planets were flung in the sky and how the stars were hung. He knew the majesty of heaven and the depths of darkness. And though he was God himself, he gave up his rights and his riches of heaven, and he took on flesh and the vulnerability of humanity. He made himself nothing. He became the servant of all. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. And out of love for us, he entered into darkness and sin and brokenness and death. And out of love for us, Christ rose victoriously from the grave, which means that Christ's love overcomes all of our graves. Christ's love overcomes all of our deaths and all of our uh, darkness and all of our wrongness. Christ's love conquers all. And so we, as followers of Christ, we are called to follow Christ by doing the exact same thing. By modeling what Christ has done for us, laying down our own rights, our own rightness, and walking in the path of love. And so what do we do when we disagree? We will lay down our inflated knowledge and our rights, and we will put on love that builds us up in perfect unity. It is because of Christ's resurrection It's because of his victory over death and selfishness and egos and inflated knowledge. It's because of his victory over all of our brokenness that we have a source of power to love others more than ourselves. And as believers in the resurrection, we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, which means the gospel, the gospel, the good news of Jesus is not just moral advice or a recipe for spiritual, private spirituality. It's an announcement about Jesus that opens up a whole new lens, a whole new reality where we can see every part of our life through the lens of the good news of Jesus. And that's what we're called to. So this morning, we're gonna um, close this time and transition to uh, another time of worship with, with a prayer, okay? Sometimes we do these posture prayers where I ask you to uh, hold your arms in certain ways and it's really just a way to make the inward self like kind of be modeling or your outward self model what we're trying to do with our hearts to change our posture. In order, us, in order for us to follow the way of love that Christ leads us, we sometimes have to change our posture. And so we're going to do that in an outward way to represent what we're asking God to do in our hearts. And so we're going to do a posture prayer that is one of mission, that moves us from a place of sort of skepticism and and standoffishness to to one that follows Christ in his mission to love the world. So I'm going to invite you to just take your arms as we pray together, and I'm going to ask you to cross them, just like this. And as I pray, I'm going to invite you to pray Um, with me. (sighs) Father God, it's so easy to take a posture of skepticism, of cynicism, a posture of frustration, a posture that looks at the rest of the world, even our brothers and sisters in Christ, and say, ah, you've got it wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. How could you possibly do that? 
be that, believe that. It's so easy for us to fall into that. And so I'm going to invite you in the quietness of, of your spirit um, to just allow that confession to ring, that if there are areas or people or groups or relationships where that has been your posture, I'm going to invite you to um, speak those to the Holy Spirit, to acknowledge those areas of your life. And, and maybe that's the Holy Spirit sort of poking you on the shoulder and saying, hey, this posture has to change. And I'm going to go ahead and invite you to move to a posture of surrender. You're going to put your hands out to the side as best you can without hitting the person next to you. Sort of in the sign of the cross, opening up your hands to symbolize what, what Christ has done for us. Father, you call us to move from the posture of cynicism and skepticism into one of love that lays down our rights, that lays down what is owed to us, that lays down what we can take and which is fine to do, and instead to take on the posture of Christ who laid down his life for those he loved. And so Father God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would begin to work in us, to move us to reflect more fully what Christ has done for us to reflect his love so that our body of believers might be built up so that your body might be built up in love we get real worried that we're going to get taken advantage of or that Christ is going to be taken advantage of but Father, you don't seem concerned with that. And I think it's because you know that no matter what, you win. So we don't have to worry. We can trust and rest in you because love conquers all. So Father God, work in us, work through us. We want to look more like you. We pray all these things in your name. I'm going to invite you to stand with us as we sing um, one more song um, and use this song to invite the Holy Spirit to come in.